Welcome to The Ways of Water, a podcast series exploring our English waterways through the arts, ecology, industrial history, well-being, and the deep mysteries of water itself. Presented by me, David Bramwell, and with the occasional guest appearances from the inimitable John Shuttleworth and his neighbour Ken. Uh, I'm Tristan Gooley. I've been passionate about navigation pretty much all my life and natural navigation for, for 20 or more years. Natural navigation for me is the art of finding a way using nature. We can use anything our senses pick up. For me, it's been the most exciting way to reveal the, the landscapes around me. So I'm driving to Arundel in West Sussex to meet Tristan and to get there I won't be using the sun, the clouds or rabbit droppings to guide me but my trusty sat nav here. But I'm hoping today that Tristan is going to reveal some of the secrets of our waterways and what we can learn from the environment next time we're by a river or a canal. So Tristan's going to teach me the basics by Swanbourne Lake and then we're going to head into town to the River Arran. Most importantly I'm hoping to find out how to win at poo sticks. I stumbled across the concept of natural navigation in my early 20s and I realised that a journey of, you know, one mile using the stars as your compass and the trees as your map was just as challenging and rewarding as, as you know, a thousand miles across wilder areas uh, using technology. It's like Blake's infinity in a grain of sand. Yeah, exactly. It's so, so interesting you say that because I was working with um, a couple of celebrities a few years ago on a, on a TV programme and they... Um, you know, they're doing an amazing job, but I think they misunderstood what, what we were trying to do. And I said to the director, I said, is it all right if I just have a chat? And, and we had this chat, and that's exactly the line that I went for. This rock by our feet here, those ripples down there in the water, are part of a, uh, an infinitely rich tapestry. If you look at the water closest to us, can you see how it appears still? And if you look at the water in the distance, it appears still. But actually, none of this water is, is particularly still. So what we find is that you can tell what the surface of the water is doing best when we get a mixture of light and dark. Have a look at any river, any body of water, and find where light and dark um, reflections mix, and you will see, you know, perhaps a thousand times more information, more detail, than if you, you look where it's wholly dark, as we're seeing on the f our side there, mm. or entirely light, as we're seeing in, in the near side here. In front of us on the water, I can see herring gulls, yeah. and we've seen coots and mallards, and I don't doubt there's some more hens down there. What can the birds tell us about the nature of water? You know, in, in very, very broad terms, the, the kingfisher is it's a signal species in the sense that you don't get them unless the, the broad ecosystem is very healthy. Mm. Swans, you know, like to feed off roots and algae and various other things off the bottom, so they favour the more shallow part um, of 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 water, um, especially if they're doing any, any feeding. So in a sense, they're giving us, they're like a depth gauge, a beautiful depth gauge. But if you take something like a cormorant, cormorants have been recorded diving to 45 meters. You know, you see a dipper, it's telling you something you probably already know that the water's fast flowing. They don't, um, dippers, you know, that's their ecology. They, they will not be found in, in, in slow streams. But there's a strange comfort that comes from knowing that and it tallying with what you're seeing. You know, in practical terms, it supports the feeling of it works. And in deeper, in a more philosophical sense, it, it, it's a connection thing. It's not about it working in a practical sense at the end. It's about us feeling, OK, I've got some insight here. I feel, I feel sort of tuned uh, into what's around me. Different words for, for rivers. I think, I think I'm correct in saying this. The word flashiness, the flashiness of a river. I brought it up because obviously we had some severe flooding over yeah. Christmas in certain parts of, of England and you were talking about how to recognise the kind of river that might be more prone to flood than others. Yes, um, the flashiness is a, um, it sounds a very sort of vague, almost sort of comic book sort of word, but actually uh, it, it is a scientific description of how rivers react to rainfall. So if you've got a, a porous rock like we've got here, like chalk, um, the rain can take, you know, months. Uh, well, it does take months. So this rain we're feeling the odd, odd sort of spot of now won't feed into the rivers for, for potentially, you know, six or seven months. So you can have a really heavy downpour in this part of the world and the rivers really don't register a, a noticeable change very quickly at all. But in other parts of the world, uh, well, other parts of Britain, um, you've got... Um, 
much harder rock, rocks that, that don't allow the, the water to percolate through, and they are much flashier. So the levels rise very, very quickly, you know, perhaps hours instead of months. And then those are the, those are the flashy rivers. Those are the ones that tend to have the, the dangerous flash floods. So if you know the, the rocks in an area, you can make an educated guess about how flashy a river is. And there's some other quite fun techniques for, for guessing at the flashiness. The style of bridge. So in a place that's very, in a river that's very flashy, the bridges have to take account of the fact that the water levels may change, you know, several metres, you know, in, in days, as opposed to, you know, a few centimetres over weeks. Uh, so they tend to have very high arches. So those, those are the parts of the country where we see these, these great big sort of tall arches over, over a river. Whereas in this part of the world, the arches sit very low because the water levels, it's, they're, they're not flashy rivers. The water levels change very, very steadily. <laughs> and it's slippy, isn't it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can you see it? If you come down here... Got it, yes. Yeah, these, these, where the ripples are, are going over each other, we get a crosshatch pattern. Yeah. It, these, these two uh, coots are going to do it again, create that crosshatch pattern there. That pattern, incredibly simple, but it, it's exactly that pattern that helped uh, Pacific Islanders find land in the middle of the ocean. So it's just noticing that when ripples hit something or move over each other or reflect or bounce off anything, they create certain patterns. And... If you see ripples march, and we'll, we'll, walk, we'll walk on perhaps and have a look for it, whenever ripples um, or waves bounce into, hit something like a, a small rock in a pond or a, a, an island in a lake or an island in an ocean, certain distinct patterns are formed. The, the ripples reflect back, and we'll, we'll have a look for that down here. Um, but they also wrap around it uh, and create a, a crosshatch pattern on the, on the far side. Um, and it, it's that disturb those those patterns that allowed navigators lying on outrigger canoes in in the middle of the ocean to find islands. But that we can see exactly the same patterns uh, in in any body of water where there are ripples bounce. There's another thing for us to look at. Actually, can you Birds. see the? Yeah, 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 it looks. It's a coot. Uh, yeah, it is. It is a coot. Yes, um, heading away. Did you see the wake pattern it made? Yeah, it's, it's yeah, just yeah. spreading out now. What's interesting is. Um, Wakes, again, we sort of see them and we don't register anything of interest, but wake patterns uh, follow certain rules. So actually, the, the angle that that wake pattern was moving out behind the coot was um, almost identical, well, pretty much identical to the one we see behind boats. And in fact, it's the same pattern you see if you put, draw a stick through the water. Hmm. It spreads out 40 degrees. So if you're standing on the back of a boat looking, looking astern... It will be, if you extend your hand and make a fist, it'll be four fists from one wake to the other. It's exactly the same thing for the duck. If the duck looks back or the, the uh, coot or a moorhen looks back, they will see the same thing. So this is, you know, there, there are sort of so many of these, I've collected over 700 of these little building blocks and you put them all together and we, we start to build a, a picture of what's going on. Well, sadly, we haven't time to hear all 700. So here are five of my favorites. Getting a nice little, nice little effect down here, actually. A little, um, I think it's a cat's paw there, um, and a cat's paw is, is just the, the nickname for when a, a gust of wind is touching one bit of the water, but but not another. And the reason it's darker is because the we're not seeing as much of the reflected sky. Single-engine helicopters have to, when they're crossing towns or cities, have to fly over um, the river. Uh, the logic being <laughs> an engine failure in a single engine helicopter. It's not good news for who's in the helicopter, but it doesn't need to be bad news for everyone in the city as well. So they will trace the line of, you know, the Thames in London, for example, through the sky. Arab navigators had this, this word for the collection of water wisdom, um, the ability, the skill to read water called the Isharat. People who could do it possessed the Isharat and the um, the Pacific Islanders had a similar expression called the Kepsani Lamatau, which is, you know, having the water law. I, I love the idea that water is never flat. Look at a glass of water and you'll see that it goes up at the edges. There, there's a rim, a meniscus, and again, that's the stickiness. The water's sticking to the glass. It's that, that stickiness that allows capillary action. That's how all of these trees around us are able to get, you know, tons and tons of water from by our feet to, to 20 metres up. The fastest line of water in a river isn't exactly in the middle. So all rivers um, curve and the Thalweg uh, sits just on the outer bend side of the middle. 
uh, and it's absolutely vital for winning poo sticks because the, the amateur poo sticks player, and uh, there are many of them, and, uh, and good luck to them, but the amateur will, will opt for the middle. OK, so now we're off to the River Arran to see what we can learn there. Now I learnt earlier from Tristan that the height of a bridge can tell us a lot about the water levels of a river. So here I go with my first attempt at some natural navigation. So this is the River Arran, yeah. and it's gently meandering through the, the centre of the town. We've got a bridge behind us, I'm going to use my navigation skills here, so that's... Uh, is that a low arch or a high arch? I guess that's a... Is that a fairly high arch? No, no, that's, that's a low that's arch. Very low. I mean, if you're standing on the water, you could pretty much touch it. A high arch is, you know, as tall as a, you know, two, three-story building sometimes. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing about the river here is that it is, it is tidal. Uh, so we see slightly more, well, a lot more variation than you would do from a purely rain-fed uh, river. Um, so flashiness, you know, applies in tidal rivers, but it's not, not the dominant feature here. If you came to this river for the first time and you had no idea whether it's tidal uh, or only flows one way, there's a not perfect but quite strong clue in the boats we see here. Any, anybody uh, mooring a boat will sensibly do it into the stream. Yeah. So if the stream only flows one way, you find all boats pointing one way. But here we can see, you know, one, two, three pointing that way, one, two, three pointing that way, and that's quite a strong indicator that this is, this is tidal. And what about someone who, who's into wild swimming, or as you say, swimming? Uh, <laughs> what, uh, are there any things that any uh, things they should look out for, be wary of? Um, any messages from, from, from the river that uh, might suggest that it wouldn't be a good idea to take a dip in that, uh, in that stretch? It is one of those areas where, where local wisdom is, is hugely important as well, because the, one of the patterns that, that can be helpful is, is what has happened in the past, frankly, and it's as true you know, at the sea as it, as it is in rivers. If, if the flow is changing at all anywhere, there will be evidence on the surface of the water. And in fact, we can see that here. We're seeing these, these eddies all the way along the left here, because what's happened is the water's come around the bend and there's a slight headland jutting out there. That's sending these these um, little eddies spinning and where you see them it is always worth looking for the the counter flow the eddy at the edge to wrap up what would what advice would you give to people who are inspired to want to employ a little natural navigation the next time they go walk by a river or or you know go down a canal in their barge i'd um you know give yourself a, um, two or three patterns to look for within the water and then there's a broader thing you can do as well which helps helps sharpen our, our interest and awareness which is um, if you're going for a journey on foot or, or in a boat if you um, let somebody else have access to to any maps and whether electronic or paper but at the end of your journey however short it is just get a piece of paper out and trace the line of what you think you did. Okay, we went this way and then we turned. Doesn't matter whether you call it left or west or whatever you want to call it, you know, your name for it. We turned here a bit and then we turned here a bit and then there was a very long straight bit. Uh, and then just compare that with, with what you actually did. Uh, and you'll find that just to do that exercise makes you look at both the water, the land and the sky uh, with a with a, a, a keenness and a, an interest in, in the little clues that, that perhaps wasn't there the day bef before. Tristan, thank you. Thanks a lot, David. Ways of Water was presented by me, David Bramwell, and with music by Oddfellows Casino. Find out more via drbramwell.com and check out Oddfellows Casino on Bandcamp, where you'll also find links to my album and book, The Cult of Water. Many thanks to all the guests in this series and to you, the listener. Watery blessings to you all.